zijn hier uh, op een speciale avond van uh, Crossing Border met Dame Hilary Mantel. Um, even voordat we beginnen een paar uh, zakelijke mededelingen. Uh, na afloop is er voor iedereen een exemplaar van een veiliger oord uh, beschikbaar, zoals u weet. Uh, dat doen we na afloop. Ik heb een andere uitgave, maar die van u ziet er veel mooier uit, eerlijk gezegd. Uh, na afloop zal uh, Hillary Mantel ook uh, uw exemplaar willen signeren als u daar prijs op stelt. Uh, beneden in de hal is er ook een stal van boekhandel De Vries van Stockholm, waar ook uh, Engelstalig werk van Hillary uh, verkrijgbaar is en ook andere boeken van haar. Dus um, nou ja, dat zijn de, uh, de zakelijke punten. We gaan het hebben over een veiliger oord, in het Engels A Place of Greater Safety. Het eerste boek van haar en uh, voor de liefhebbers gaan we het ook een heel klein beetje hebben over The Mirror and the Light, het uh, de derde deel van de trilogie over Thomas Cromwell... die uh, komend voorjaar in april bij Meridiaan Uitgevers zal verschijnen in Nederland. Dus um, laten we beginnen. Ik ga kijken waar mevrouw Mentel is. <lacht> Ik zie... Ja, hè, maar ze was er net wel. Daar is ze. <lacht> Well, this must be a little bit strange. You just finished writing The Mirror and the Light, the final installment of your trilogy about Thomas Cromwell. And now we're here to discuss Een Veiliger Oort, the first novel you wrote yes. many years ago. Many years ago, yes. Um, it's never left me, those people. I would say they're with me every day. Really? They were such an important part of my life. I started the book when I was 22, mm -hmm. just out of university. I finished the first draft when I was 27. Yes. So when you are that age, that is a huge bite out of the life True. you've lived. True. <laughs> It's a big percentage. Yes. And it felt very much like the 15 years <laughs> that I've now yes, spent yes. on the Thomas Cromwell trilogy. True. So they were deeply embedded yes. in my life. Yes. And I think there's a particular intensity about historical fiction, mm -hmm. about the process of working on it. These are real people. They happen to be dead but they are as real as you and me. Yes. And you have a responsibility to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think with contemporary fiction, you can be freer, more tricksy. Um, I, I have a novel called Flood, uh, not yet translated into Dutch, But uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yes. Well. Uh, and in Flood, I just got so terribly angry with one of the characters. So I made her spontaneously combust. <laughs> 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 We need a translation. <laughs> yeah. Now, with Henry VIII, even if we were having a bad day, <laughs> or let us say, Louis the Sixteenth, I couldn't do that. No, no, <laughs> no. Hence the difficulty and intensity yes. of the process. Yes, but still, you love historical fiction. Yeah, it's... When I began, you see, Liddy, I thought... I want to write this one novel. I want to write this novel about the French Revolution. But only part way through, I thought, maybe 
And I could write another historical novel after this one. But it didn't ever occur to me that I might write contemporary fiction. Because that seemed to me as different as writing poetry or music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I felt perhaps I've no gift for that. And like a lot of writers who are beginning, I thought I won't be able to do it because I can't make plots. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm not even very interested in plots. But then later, I realized the character makes the plot. Yes. And so that difficulty dissolves. And also, the story is there, for, in a way. The, 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 in the historical fiction. Yes. Yes. But I realized I could also um, write contemporary fiction mm -hmm. if I got rid of this hang-up I had about plot and just concentrated on, on the people. Yes. Uh, but in historical fiction, exactly, in a very simple way, God has done the plot for you. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe I can go with this. Yes, I'll get away with it. <laughs> but you see, I was naive because I thought if you research and research, you will find out everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. But within a very short time, I realized there are huge gaps in the historical record. And you may know that an event occurred, and it may be an event necessary to your fiction, but you have no detail, uh, you, you, and you don't know why. Motive is always missing. Yes. And so I realized very quickly that it isn't enough to research. You have to acquire the art of building a scene, mm -hmm. of telling a story, even though the baseline story, yes, is the known. beat of it, yes. it's already there for you. Yes. But still, you wrote this novel, mm -hmm. it wasn't immediately published, and then you wrote two contemporary novels, and they were published. The, th the thing is, Lydia, when it was finished, okay, I was, I'd been living out of England for some time. Yes. And anyway, I didn't come from the kind of people who know writers mm -hmm. or know publishers. So I had no contacts at all. So I had to write a letter to agents saying, mm, might you look at my novel, please? It's yes, very long. It's hefty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about the French Revolution. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's not a romance. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know which bit <laughs> they were not responding to. <laughs> But I couldn't even get people to read it. I could not get it onto a publisher's desk, except one. And they kept it for a bit, and then they sent it back with some pages missing. <laughs> and, uh -huh. um, in those days, those far off days in history. Yes, a historical this novel was serious. Is such, yes. Um, because my copy was 6,000 miles away. Because in those days, you know, it was typewriter, mm -hmm. sheet of carbon, one carbon copy. Yes, yes. And so, believe it or not, my other manuscript was in Botswana. <laughs> and yes, and page the, the, the mail 374 was, was, was missing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The mail service was not reliable. No, no. So. For the publisher to lose a chunk of 50 pages, 50. Um, it was, you know, yeah. brought me to a full stop temporarily. Yes. And so years went by, and I thought, now, I must think of a plot. Um, I will write a contemporary novel, mm -hmm. and it will be short, and it will be completely different. Yes. And then if they turn that down, maybe I'm no good. 
but mm -hmm. I will use this as a, a wedge, you see, yes. to get into the door. Um, and I did that, and my plot worked in every sense. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I sold a contemporary novel. Then I wrote its sequel. Mm -hmm. And then things seemed to be going so well. And I put the Revolution novel on a high shelf, and for years I didn't look at it because I became afraid of it. Mm -hmm. It emanated a certain power, yes. you know. My youth was locked up in that uh -huh. novel. Yes. And I thought, if it's never published, what a waste. But things are going well. Don't rock uh, the boat. And, yeah, exactly. And people were still not very interested in the French Revolution. <laughs> and uh, it, it, so then it was more or less an accident that made me turn back to it. Um, a friend of mine, Claire Boylan, the Irish writer, was writing an article for a newspaper about people's unpublished first novel. Mm. And, <laughs> you know, she called me up and said, have you got one? And, <laughs> <laughs> and you looked at the cupboard? I had this moment when I thought, the wise course is to lie. Because if you say, yes, I have, Claire, everything changes from this moment onwards. You will have to face your past. Maybe you will have to face your future. Mm -hmm. But she was a friend and she had her article to write. And so I said, yes. And I said, moreover, it's 300,000 words long. It's, yes, it's complete. And... So, so you then, told about it you in know, the paper. Um, I, it was just a little. She was interviewing about a dozen authors, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, they'd written their first novel at the age of six. Yes. And it was about <laughs> myself and my pet rabbit. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. Uh, but, now here's the thing. Claire said... Um, when she had amassed all this information, she went to an agent and um, she said, how much are these novels worth? Well, for a place of greater safety, um, the, my French Revolution novel, they named a very considerable sum. <laughs> so um, I hmm. thought, okay, maybe it's worthwhile. Yes. You know, uh, want the agent who she approached said, okay, so this will be worth a lot more than her contemporary fiction. So there was a good incentive, yes. you see, because young writers always need money. Yeah. And uh, so I took it off the shelf. Yes. I told my publisher that it existed. Then I waited for the article to come out. Yes. And then everything changed. Your instinct was right. Well, what happened then was they wanted to publish it and they wanted to publish it in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So I said, give me one summer, one publishing season to go through it again. Yes. Because um, 1979, I finished that first dra draft, we were now 1992, and a good deal had happened in revolutionary studies Yes, um, since that time. And the main thing was the rise of feminist scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I have been keeping up, and I thought, I must go back to my book, and I must... I must do better by the women. I must think about them more. And now I have the confidence to build their stories, yes. Yes. even if it's not on the record. Mm -hmm. So that summer I worked very, very hard. And 
I built up the characters of the women and I also put some jokes in. Yes, yes. <laughs> because now I had the confidence. Yes. So I would say the first draft was very solemn uh, and the second draft, uh, and the, the draft that became the novel mm -hmm. had a much more frivolous tone. <laughs> <laughs> um, in other words, I felt able to be myself. Yes. And so we won with that. So it was yes, published. Yes, it became better. Yeah, I, I was a better writer by yes, then. I yes. had more confidence. Yes. And um, the changes only amounted to, I would say, about 10% mm -hmm. of the book because mm -hmm. the time was so short. Yes. So essentially, when I pick up the novel these days, I'm meeting my 20-something yes. self. Yes. Which is quite right because... I think often what people don't realise is the people who made the revolution were so young. Mm -hmm. By 35, they were dead. Yes. Um, and they Just, lived a double life, really, yeah. yes. Sanchez yes. Just was 26. Yes. He'd never had a job. He was the world's first professional revolutionary. <laughs> yes. And they... The energy, the hope, it only comes from young people. Mm -hmm. And it came from me when I was writing the book. Yes, you were a young woman, a young mm. aspiring, aspiring writer, and you chose this subject. You said, you just mentioned nobody was interested in the French Revolution. You were. Yeah. How um, come? Well, I think I have to go back probably to, let's say, if you meet Hillary at the age of four, um, I think that's really where the novel starts. Mm. Because before I went to school, I asked my mother, what if I don't like it? Can I just try it? Then if I don't like it, I can stay at home. And you wrote in Giving Up the Ghost, you thought it was... Uh, <laughs> Something yeah. you could uh, stop with. Yeah, school. yeah. She said, um, no, you have to go. <laughs> so I said, why? She said, it's the law. And I thought, that law needs changing. <laughs> you were a revolutionary <laughs> at four. <Already. laughs> yes. At four. And then off to school I went. And by the time I'm six, I realise that people in the class are all treated quite differently. Mm -hmm. um, you don't expect liberty as a little child, but you expect equality. Yes. And I realised that by the age of six, the teachers had sorted us out. We were doing work from two different blackboards. Really? And on one side of the classroom, there were the children from the big families mm -hmm. wearing their brothers and sisters clothes and the refugee children of whom there were many in the village where I grew up who maybe didn't speak English at home so the teachers didn't think this maybe is a very intelligent child no but we put them on that side Not a big and on the other side the well-dressed, quiet, well-behaved children um, from smaller families. Mm -hmm. And already I'm thinking, no, this, this is wrong. And I think, you know, to be serious for a moment, I think my passion for justice mm -hmm. started there. there. Yes. And then, you see, I wasn't very good at being a child. So... Childhood to me is the old regime mm -hmm. and revolution is growing up. Yes. And this is exactly the metaphor that Jean-Jacques Rousseau makes. Rousseau says the king is the image of the father. The people are the image of his children. So until those people have self-determination, they're in the state of childhood. Yes. And revolution is those people trying to take the rights in their own lives. And 
it seemed to me that you had a whole nation asking for the rights of adults. When you're a child, you have to obey the rules whether you understand them or not, whether you agree with them or not. And the worst thing about childhood is you don't understand the reasoning behind the rules mm -hmm. and no one explains to you. So any repressive regime politically yes. echoes that situation. Yes. And I think when I got into my teens, my family was not happy. There was authority, but there was no good authority. Mm -hmm. There was no trusted authority. So again, when I came to study the revolution at school, very briefly, something resonated. Yes, yes. I, I had a good teacher, um, and we only had really two lessons, causes of the revolution, events of the revolution. But our teacher made you feel she knew a lot more than she had time to tell you. Yes. And that's a very good quality in a history mm -hmm. teacher. Uh, and it made me want to know more. But when I went to read about it, what I found was very disappointing. Because, first of all, the English have never really been very interested in the French Revolution. They'd never understood it. So everything I was reading was written from a reactionary point of view. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view that the revolution was doomed yes. from the start. Yes. So it's all hindsight. Mm -hmm. And also, I turn to fiction. And what do I find? I find romances mm -hmm. about lady with, ladies with high hair. Yes. And it's all about the aristocrats. And already I knew enough to say, but those are not the good stories. It's the revolutionaries yes. that have the good stories. Because I was also imagining you were uh, well, young yourself, as you were, as you mentioned, of course. But it was also the 60s when we had all kinds of changes in society happening. Yeah. Although... I grew up in the north of England. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening now there. The 1960s have arrived around 1990. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but I did, uh, I did go s to the London School yes. of Economics, to university. Yes. yes. Which was a ferociously political mm -hmm. institution which absolutely suited me. Yes. And I became involved in student politics in a mild yes. sort of way. Uh, and the story stayed. You know, uh -huh. this, it, it stuck in my mind that maybe one day you'll do something about this. But I thought I've missed my chance to study history. And somehow, when you are 18, 19, 20, to have missed a chance, it sounds as if you will never get that thing back. You know, adults were telling you all the time, you have to run your life correctly. You do this, then this, then this, mm -hmm. and you must make good choices. And it's like being on an escalator. Yes. And you can't get off, you can't change your mind. So, when I decided that I wanted to write this mm -hmm. book, I really wanted to study the revolution very seriously. But I thought, I'm not a historian. I can't be a historian. What can I do? I can write a novel. Any fool <laughs> can write a novel. <laughs> so, okay. um, and I thought, well, I, after all, I've been reading novels yes. since I was able to read. Mm -hmm. The principles, the structure, um, the techniques, they were embedded. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't have the ambition to be a writer, but you're taking this in. Yes. Unconsciously. Yes. Uh, just as I suspect nowadays, everyone knows how to write a film. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. the knowledge is yes. in there and it needs fetching out. Yes. We've all seen, particularly a Hollywood film, we've seen it structured so often. And if you don't have a certain incident 10 minutes in, Mm -hmm. the audience begins to think, yes. what's wrong? <laughs> you <know. laughs> You've lost me. <laughs> yeah. So we all know these things. Yes. Um, and as I say, I didn't want to be a writer. I just wanted to write that one book. Yeah, because that was the book you wanted to read. Yes, it didn't exist. So what do you do? You go about making it. Well, I don't think everybody <laughs> would do that, but <laughs> if you say so. Um, <laughs> you had to do a lot of research, I imagine, and you weren't living in England. I, I was initially, yes. Initially. I, I couldn't have done the research out of the country. Um, starting in around about 1974, um, I... I had about three and a half years solidly in libraries, except, yes. of course, I had a job. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was evenings, weekends. So you were very dedicated. You yeah, really wanted I mean, to read that book. I, I turned over my life to it mm -hmm. because once begun, I realised, yes, it was a very serious enterprise for me. Yes. And... Also, um, I began to get a sense very early of the complexity of the material. Mm -hmm. And you, if you're going to do it, you, you, you must do it properly, I think, with historical fiction. I'm not someone who skates on the surface. No. And, you know, you have to remember, all the people in the book are real people. Yes. Whereas many historical novelists they just use a certain period as a backdrop yes and the plot they put on top of that is entirely fiction well that's still not easy but it's it's easier than when you're working with real people their interconnections you have to get them right and you have to people your book down to the mm -hmm. smallest yes characters that's doing it properly without too much information in many cases, I yeah. imagine. Um, yes, but luckily, um, the people of the revolution, I would say they were self-conscious and it was an age of self-revelation. Yes. So some of them actually left behind considerable biographical writing. That usually applies to the, the people who made it to middle age. Yes. The young <laughs> revolutionaries tended not. But to. there were many, I was yeah. impressed by the amount of papers they yes. had. Um, and, you know, there are letters, yes. there are working documents, a politician's working documents, drafts of speeches, all these are informative, plus, one of my characters is a writer. Yes. And he's a journalist. So you just look at his work. And this is so different from my later people, the Tudors. Yes. Who, with very few exceptions, don't reveal themselves at no, all. No. So. In that way, you were lucky starting out as a, as a novelist with this. Yes. History. Except that. Um, of course, there is this interesting problem that when these people were born in provincial obscurity, mm -hmm. no one looked at them and said, in 30 years, he will be famous. <laughs> no. So it's not like writing about kings and queens who have been studied from their cradle. No. So what you tend to have is... Uh, 30 years of obscurity and then suddenly 
the, the person light. steps onto the public stage. On the stage. Yes. And this moment intrigues me when a person steps into the light of history. Because at that moment, it's as if they split. Um, and there's the historical figure and the real person. Mm -hmm. Because they were conscious of this. They were self-conscious about the revolution. They knew they were trying to do things that were new in the history of the world. And they knew that they would be famous or infamous. Yes. Uh, and therefore, it, it is as if they can stand back and study themselves. So in other words, they're telling a story about themselves mm -hmm. right from the beginning. Yes. And, and this entrance into history... It's like an actor stepping onto the stage. Suddenly, you're under the lights. And when you have been, when you have stood up in front of a huge crowd of people and raised them to action, okay. and those people have carried you on their shoulders... You're not the same next day. <laughs> you, you moved into a different sphere in your own eyes. You are no longer just the man you were. You're a myth as well. Is that something you have experienced yourself as well, becoming famous? Oh, goodness, with your, no. <laughs> with, your, with, your, no. <laughs> with winning prizes and... No, I do not inspire the same passion in my oh, audiences. Look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, if I said to you, the Bastille must fall, <laughs> you'd say... We would go. We would <laughs> Sometime. <laughs> not Mali felt but, uh, it. No. Uh, no, I think it's not quite the same. No. Also, you know, a writer enters into public consciousness, usually rather gradually. Mm -hmm. And then some people who read your early work they become quite angry when you become famous because they say you were a secret and now everybody's uh, you, got to You were away. mine. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. yes, which is rather sweet. Yes, I do think so, yeah. yeah. Well, let's get back to the, your main characters yeah. in uh, a place of greater safety. You have three young revolutionaries, mm. the story evolves around. Why these three and who, who are they? Um, the first character I began to work with, so to speak, uh, was Camille Desmoulins. Yes. Who is the one of the three who is not famous. I mean, he's moderately famous, as it were, in revolutionary studies, but he's not one of the top guys. So... The thing about Camille is he's a journalist. First of all, he's a failed lawyer, um, like me. But I'm a failed lawyer because I didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, Camille ha was a f he didn't have any money either, but he also had a stammer. Yes. So, yes. so um, putting him into the law was not a very good idea on his father's part. Uh, and so he only found himself when he began to write. And as a, a young woman, myself beginning mm -hmm. to write, yes. I felt, I really understand you. Because it was all about style. And if he mm -hmm. could make a beautiful sentence, he didn't care what it said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, his interpunction. <laughs> and therefore, he was someone, he was a very clever young man, but not the most stable character. And it was very easy for him to nudge his journalism towards violence, towards the extremes, all for the sake of that beautiful sentence. Um, and I felt I understood that. And also, 
The thing that first struck me uh, was a little event from his life. Uh, he wanted to be married. And the only way to get married was to do it through the Roman Catholic Church. But he, the church had fallen out with him and he'd fallen out with the church. So it was going to be quite hard to get a priest to marry him. So a priest said, yes, maybe, but you have to come to confession. So he went to confession, but he took a lawyer with him. <laughs> Yeah. If you are a Roman Catholic, that is very funny. <laughs> and, and so I thought, yeah, he's my man. Yes, gotcha. <laughs> so I put him at the centre of the book. And then how did he manage to be a close friend of both Jean-Jacques Danton and Maximilien Robespierre? Two figures of the revolution who... Most of the time, politically, they're in step. Only at the end, they're not. But in character, so different. And, of course, this led me into their characters. So they became the triangular structure yes, of yes. the book. And with Danton, you have a man who is all persona, he's all front, and his persona is, I am a bluff, plain speaking, man of the people. And it happens that he's a big man, a heavy man, a big impressive figure. He's ugly got a, man? A, a, an ugly, ugly man. He's got scars which seem to tell their own story. Um, and he has a wonderful, big orator's voice. But behind that, there is a very slick, calculating yes. brain. Yes. He is a very sophisticated man. And of those three people, he is the one who, under the old regime, he would have succeeded. He was already... Uh, as a lawyer, he was already getting clients, being offered good work. But he wanted more. He was an opportunist. He thought, I will... He was a gambler. Mm -hmm. He thought, I'll risk it on the revolution. Yes. And this will give me the real rewards. So he's a character about whom I feel very ambivalent. In that the big question that we can never completely resolve is, was he corrupt? Was he from the middle of the revolution? Was he in the pay of the court? Was he in the pay of the English? The English yes. Or possibly the Austrians? Or all of them? <laughs> um, his attitude was, I take their money, I don't do what they say. Yes. Uh, and you become conscious that you have to read it two ways then. He's what he represents himself to be or he is something much darker. And then what opens up is the secret history of the revolution. The underworld of spies and fixers of financial manipulation. Um, you know, the, uh, the revolution isn't undermined necessarily on the battlefield or by political action or by political rhetoric. It's undermined by foreign powers flooding the country with false banknotes. Mm -hmm. You know, you attack the economic substructure. And this history suddenly opens up to you. And she thinks, so nothing is what it seems. No. And then... Which is not lovely for a novelist, of course. It's, it's beautiful, but bewildering. Yes. 
because you're asking your reader, believe this version, and now uh, it's like you're turning a page and you find another book. Yes. And I can only hint at those mechanisms going on mm -hmm. below the surface. Mm -hmm. So I'm dealing with a character whom I don't trust. No. <laughs> uh, which makes for some interesting tension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other main character, Robespierre, is the great hate figure of the revolution, certainly in the English-speaking world. And... He's the man who, once dead, carried the blame for everything. And I became angry about this at a very early stage because I realised that what struck me, um, my anxiety and my interest, it wasn't only in the revolution itself, but in the way these figures were represented. Mm -hmm. And I began to think so much of Robespierre's reputation was made posthumously. He was dead, stick him with the blame. He was brought down by men who were far, far worse in every sense than he was. And also, I realised that he never had the power with which those people wished to credit him. For good mm -hmm. or ill, he never had absolute power. So then, you see, you begin to think, well, most of what I've been told about the revolution is coming from this reactionary uh, point of view. Let's see how it looks when we move forward with them. Mm -hmm. We take them back to their childhoods. Now, you see, Robespierre is so different from Danton. He, with him, what you see is what you get. You have a small, slight, mild-mannered man who has no orator's manners and can hardly raise his voice so that he can be heard in a large hall. So he has to create the conditions under which people listen to him carefully. And I began to feel that, well, first of all, that he had been unjustly treated by a great many biographers. And then just how interesting he was because his political instincts were so finely tuned. Mm -hmm. Robespierre opposed the war, which um, the, the faction in the revolution, sometimes called the Girondin, whom later history represents as a wonderfully lovely bunch of liberals, <laughs> they were the people who, in their foolishness, decided to declare war on the rest of Europe. And Robespierre opposed this until he became a lone voice opposing it. And he said, this will end either in our military defeat and occupation, or it will end with a mi military dictatorship. And of course it did. Mm -hmm. It ended with Napoleon. Yes. And as soon as you're in wartime conditions, then security becomes the main object. And in effect, it is the end of the revolution. Yes. Because it's then that the terror begins, the war on the internal enemy. And the wonderful, expansive spirit of the revolution is dead because you're in wartime yeah. conditions. Yeah. Now, I s began to see how Robespierre acquired ascendancy 
because he was almost always right. And as time went on, people began to see this. Um, it, I think and think about the book. And when I got to the end of it, you know, I thought maybe I should have given the reader sympathies a big push in Robespierre's direction. Because most readers will still react to his name as if you're naming the devil. But for better or worse, I didn't do that. I, I tried to let him speak for himself. What, what would you, you would tell about him makes me also think about Thomas Cromwell as also somebody who had a bad reputation yeah. and somebody you wanted to give his own voice, his own perspective. I uh, wanted to wipe the record and yes. start again. Yes. And it isn't that I have a wish to rehabilitate okay. these people or turn them into saints. I just want justice. <laughs> That's all. You're still four years old. Yeah, I'm yes. six years old. Um, and again, it's like this question about how someone is represented. Yes. And of course, in every sense, to go back to the French Revolution, representation is the issue. Mm -hmm. how, yes. how may... Uh, people are getting the vote for the first time. How does one man represent yes, another? Yes. How does democracy work? Mm -hmm. So it, there's a double um, question of representation. Yes. It's, it's, it's an amazing novel. It's, well, so many things happen in so little time, really, a couple of years. Um, yeah. Uh, Five years yes. of revolution. And those people have lived the equivalent of 20 yes. years. Yes. And what particularly strikes you about Danton is he is exhausted. Yes. He's always trying to go back to the country. He says, I'm retiring. <laughs> um, but you don't retire from revolution. No. He, 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 he died. But uh, while reading the book, obviously... I was living in 2019, well, yes. I was reading it the, the last couple of weeks, and thinking about society now and seeing, well, perhaps, um, I, was, I, I was thinking that I saw similarities, people, mm. uh, populism coming up, uh, the, 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 the yellow vests in, in Paris. Is that something that, do you also see similarities or is that my fevered mind? I, I think that's a very interesting movement because of the way it apparently has no leaders and no one focus. And as an instance of popular protest, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it, it's very hard to file it neatly. Uh, and, you know, there are examples of similar things. Mm -hmm. If you go into my Tudor yes, books. Yes, true. Uh, but it's not in itself a revolutionary movement. No. It's an expression of discontent. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful expression of discontent. But I think, the, in a larger sense, the questions of how we obtain liberty and what we do with it when we've got it and how we create equality in society. Mm -hmm. These questions never no. go away. And, and the revolutions there, at the, the dawn for Europe of these questions, and they're today still vital, still urgent. They're not questions that you can solve mm -hmm. uh, because every generation needs a new response. A every generation, in a sense, needs its own revolution, even if it's one that seems to turn backwards. Yes, yes. And I think, to me, uh, 
Well, you know, there's a story um, about one of the leaders of the Chinese Revolution. And uh, it wasn't Mao, but some people say it was Chou Enlai. Mm -hmm. And they said to him, what is the importance of the French Revolution? And he said, it is too early to tell. <laughs> and I absolutely you agree? agree with that. <laughs> yes. You just mentioned that this is a, a novel written by a young person, mm. a young writer. And now you just finished your Cromwell trilogy. And I'm an old writer. Yes. And, it's, <laughs> and it's, it, what, are the, what, was the, what was different writing these books, these Cromwell books, if you compare it with writing the French Revolution book? I, I think... When I wrote the French Revolution book, it threw up every problem that a novelist can confront, and particularly the processing of complex information into story. Mm -hmm. And there is a point towards the end of the book, I have to explain and unfold to the reader a huge financial scandal. Uh, it's a stock market fraud that its ramifications went on and on. Yes. And it ended with the fall of Danton and his friends. And we call this the East India Company affair. Yeah. And I thought, I will never. <laughs> it is the closest as I've come to despair <laughs> as a novelist. I, thought, I can never, never present this to the reader, because, and this is the historical novelist nightmare, you have to introduce a whole bunch of new characters at a really late stage in the narrative. They suddenly become important. You've never heard of them before. No time for a build-up. So why will they matter to the reader? Mm -hmm. So after I had, as best I could, written the East India Company affair into the novel, I thought, right, I can do anything now. <laughs> um, nothing has been as hard as that, ever. And all the problems, one by one, I found some kind of solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the most successful one, but I made my way through the story. And I know that for the readers at the end of the book, for those readers who can stick with it, there is an enormous emotional impact. True. And so to that extent, I have to say, I may have failed and failed and failed, but in the end I succeeded. Um, I did what I want. I made the reader care about those people. And so... When I moved on in my career, everything I learned from that book mm -hmm. gave me confidence. Use, yeah. And when I moved on to the Thomas Cromwell books, I, the huge difference is, well, there's a difference in me because I've got all this experience behind me. Mm -hmm. But the difference in the outside world is digitization of records. True. And in the 15 years I've been working on the Tudor books, every year more and more material has come online. So you sit at your desk, you want to read the Venetian state papers, there they are. Yes. And it's a huge difference. When yeah. I look back to a place of greater safety, uh, the sheer physical fatigue yes. involved in crouching hour by hour over tightly packed card indexes yes. in libraries <laughs> uh, compared to just pressing a button. Yeah, right. But I question, does that make it easier? It certainly means it can be a shorter process because you, you're not 
moving around mm -hmm. to the records are coming to you. But the more you know, the more you want to know. <laughs> and the more it's available to you, the more you want to read it, you want to know everything. But I think that it certainly made me able to research this book in depth within a reasonable time span. It doesn't seem to me that 15 years is too long. No. <laughs> um, yeah, but when uh, do you stop? <laughs> I think, you know, with, um, with, the, with this book, it reduced it to something manageable. Mm -hmm. And I could feel I have read most of what I needed to read. Whereas with the revolution, I never felt that, simply because in those days, there was no very easy way of knowing what else was out there. No. It, it was, you know, like that thing that Dom, Donald Rumsfeld said about the unknown unknowns. <laughs> you, you didn't know what material might be out there. No. Now, with the internet, you can get a much better grip on what the sources are then it's up to you whether you consult them. But, and, and does it matter that uh, the Cromwell novels are situated in England, uh, a country you know very well, and, not in, and France is, of course, an, a foreign country, a foreign culture for you? Of course, the, you might say 16th century England is a foreign country. True, to, true. but the language, yeah. for one. Well, language... Sure, but it's a foreign language as well in many respects. <laughs> um, I think, I no, I've always thought of myself as a writer from the North and a European writer. The designation of English writer has never meant very much to me because when I think of the culture I grew up in, it seems so marginal to the culture of the Protestant southeast of England where the wealth is and where everything happens. And I felt um, my identity, I felt it could only be found in Europe. And it seemed to me, when I look back, I think maybe this was a bit presumptuous to go and tell the French all about their history. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, maybe, you know, just to... to is, it, is it really like Henry VIII deciding to invade France? <laughs> um, but, but then I, I feel, feel that something overrides that, and that is that we all own the revolution whatever country we yes. come from. Yes. They are ideas of liberty, yes. equality, fraternity. Yes, we all had to They belong to all it. mankind. Yes, true. So one little English woman can do it. Um, it. She has the right to attempt it. True. And, you know, it is a question when you undertake any topic, what right have I to this subject matter? And I think... It makes a lot of people who want to write, it silences them for years mm. until somebody tells them there is a story that only you can make. And however technically deficient, however lame, however broken that story is, it is yours. And to desire to tell it is to have the right to tell it. So it seems to me. Yes. You have also said in the past that you were the one who had to write the Cromwell story and you've just finished it and um, it's going to be published in March and April. Uh, perhaps to end this discussion, I know a lot of people are very curious about it. How, how does it feel to have finished this trilogy, this oh, I'm not sure it's finished. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Um, before I, 
uh, oh, just as I was finishing the novel, um, I began work on the stage adaptation. And I have to write, by February, I need to produce the first draft of the <laughs> play. So for me, it's a seamless process. And just as the revolutionaries have never, never, never stopped. They've never stopped. stopped. No. They've never left my life. Uh, so as soon as those heads are off, they are <laughs> on again. <That's> <laughs> <laughs> and we move into a different medium. And then if we can, if we succeed with the play, then probably 2021, um, it will be on stage the year after the TV series. <laughs> so there's another life to go through. And you just told me there's going to be a t TV series as about, well, based on a place of greater safety as well. Yes, the, the Revolution book has, um, the, the option uh, is with the same team who made Wolf Hall for television very successfully. And um, this book, the, the Revolution book, there have been many offers over the years and many attempts at writing a film script. They've all been very bad. <laughs> <laughs> but now it is with people who have the power to get it made. They have the resources and the backing. And I have great faith in the director and in the screenwriter. So it's going to take a bit of time because, first of all, there is the third Cromwell book. We have to book. get Cromwell out of the yeah. way. And then they can move on to a place of safety. safety. But, you know, I don't mind. I don't mind the wait because everything about this book has been waiting. Yes, yes. And nothing has ever been simple. Uh, and... Um, and it has become better by waiting. I think it's been worthwhile waiting for the right people. Because, it, frankly, it could be a disaster. But, I, I, you know, I very much trust them on mm -hmm. the basis of mm -hmm. what they did mm -hmm. with Wolf Hall. The important thing for a screenwriter, I think, is it's, it's not in-depth knowledge of the period, because other people have that. But they have to have an instinct for what is possible in a particular yes. era. Yes. Um, for um, people's worldview. Mm -hmm. And what I found with um, the adaptation of, the, 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 of Wolf Hall, the first Cromwell novel, was that the screenwriter Peter Strawn he was really beautifully attuned to the period. And sometimes I'd say, well, you know, this detail is not quite right. We should fix that. But I never had to say, Peter, no Tudor would ever <laughs> do that. No. Because yeah, he just had the feel for yeah, it. That's, that's and I think it will be the same okay. with the Revolution yeah. book. Could you perhaps give us a little sneak preview of The Mirror and the Light. How, what can we expect of that book? Oh my gosh, now you're asking me. <laughs> to tease, uh, tease us, <laughs> tease us. Uh, okay, so people think, this is your third book. It's about the fall of Thomas Cromwell, but no, it's about the rise and rise and rise of Thomas Cromwell his sudden fall. And it is about the increasingly fraught and difficult, but fascinating evolution of Henry VIII also as a ruler and their relationship. So when we begin, uh, we begin as soon as the queen's head is severed, he walks away. So we're one moment after 
the execution of Anne Boleyn. Mm -hmm. Heartbeat away. That's how it begins. So then we see wife number three, Jane Seymour. Wife number four, the very unlucky and unhappy Anna, Anna of Cleves. And on the day of Cromwell's execution, Henry married wife number five, Catherine Howard. Within 18 months, he had executed her and married wife number six, who outlived him. But as a little test for myself, I said to myself, you must get all six wives into the book. <laughs> you know, a little yeah. challenge, you needed yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> so all six wives are in the book. And I feel that the readers who see the six wife in there and identify her, they should get a prize. <laughs> <laughs> but she is there and she comes onto the page and she has conversations. And there is a tiny little clue as to who she is. But you see, a book like this has to work for different types of readers. It has to work for historians and it has to work for people in, who will read it in translation at the other side of the world, maybe mm, nothing in, about this you know, story. The Tudors, what do they mean in Korea or Vietnam? I asked myself <laughs> as I saw the translation rights. And I suppose the answer is any country that has warlords understands Thomas Cromwell. True. Um, any family can see the story of Henry and his wives playing out, if not in their own family, among <laughs> their relatives. I don't mean the executions. <laughs> That's not very common. But they're, they're quiet tragedies. You know, Henry's search mm -hmm. for a son is feeling that He's not really a man till he has a son. Then he needs another son. The, the story of the wife, who be, uh, the mistress becomes the wife, and then there's going to be a new yeah. mistress. Yes. See, these patterns are so familiar yes. in human yes. affairs. And this gives the story, I hope, wide appeal, Yes, even if you don't get every detail. But still, you needed to have every detail right. Exactly, because it will be run through a fine sieve by historians mm -hmm. who would just love it if I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I will. I will have made mistakes, but so do they. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yours, yours then will be... Much also, more recent, uh, readable, I suppose. Also, of course, it's not done. History is no, never done. No. Um, in, in the course of time, it could turn out that we're all dead wrong. Some piece of paper, some book turns up, mm -hmm. and it might overturn yeah. all our notions. That, so is, you have to live with that. Is that a great fear of yours? No, it's something you have to live with. Mm. Uh, you have to live with the possibility of erasing your work and something else is written in there. Oh um, but that's fine. That's part of the bargain you make, I think. And of course, if a new discovery comes just in time for your book, that's lovely. Yes. Um, but even if it's not new discovery, information will come to you and you say... Oh, I wish I knew that before, but there comes a point where you must say, enough. And now, well, last week I was writing some material around the book, some little essays. So I keep taking books down from the shelf, and uh, inside every book there is a real forest of 
post-it notes. Yeah. Um, and I look at them and I think, oh, I could have put that in. Why didn't I? I could have put this in. Yeah. And then you say, no, actually, that's enough. That's yes. Enough in it. <laughs> yes. So um, I, I think I have done my very best by Thomas Cromwell. And he has certainly rewarded me. <laughs> so I think our association has been of great mutual benefit. <laughs> <laughs> and the revolutionaries? And also, um, the um, Camille, who was regarded as so hopeless by his family, who never had a penny in his pocket, who was a total failure, he sends money home now to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I would now, now give it up over to the audience. Let me see if I can see you. Yes, I can. Um, would anybody like to ask their own question to yeah. Ms. Mentel? Could you please stand up and speak loudly? <laughs> because we don't have a microphone for you. My English is not very good. So okay. You know, that's a beautiful question. I, I don't, did you, could you hear the question? Um, I think when you were writing a historical novel, you narrow your attention. But you live in the modern world and it keeps pulling at your elbow. Um, notice this, think about that. So, I just keep a big diary and I try to capture um, what's important to me, what strikes me day by day. And the material I need to be bubbling with is the material for the play. You know, that's my next move. And it will not be a simple adaptation of the book. It will be a creative venture by itself. So one of the things that happened in the course of this book was that at last I fulfilled an old ambition, which was to work in the theater. And now I am interested, not just in doing the adaptation, but maybe more plays after that, because after all, for 15 years, I've been sitting in a room by myself, except for this intermission when I worked on the plays. And so it's time I saw a bit of life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and go out there, work with other people, and have some fun. And that's, so that's my next thing. There are a couple of books I've been thinking about for a long time that, yes, in a way, they're asking to be written. I can hear their little voices from inside the cupboard. <laughs> um, but when I go back to them, it's possible that their time has passed. I think you have to be prepared for that to happen with a book. And I committed to the Cromwell Project, so other things... They had to either wait or maybe they just drop off out of my consciousness completely. But I've never been short of ideas. Uh, and I've always overlapped one book with another. So since I began in 1973, I have always been writing a book. And in one way or another, I expect that will continue. Thank you. And oh, there in the back, I see somebody. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah.
The B word. Yeah. So who would you place? Who would be the most Thomas More type of character? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Who, who is the most Thomas More type of character in the Brexit? Uh, in, in Parliament. <laughs> we, won't, we won't kill him. Okay. Well, let me say that um, the portrait of Thomas More in the book uh, has caused a great deal of controversy. But to my mind, if you are reading about him and you are not blinded by prejudice, <laughs> you will find there is a quite sympathetic portrait in there. Now, if I were to give a portrait of some of our recent politicians, mm -hmm. it would be far less flattering. <laughs> um, you know, I have written a book of short stories with the title, The Assassination of Margaret Thatcher. Yes. And, um, uh, you know, uh, only... A couple of weeks ago, a very respectable elderly gentleman stopped me in my hometown and said, could you not please write the assassination of Boris Johnson? <laughs> 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 and that is roughly my feeling. <laughs> Beheading is too good for these people. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Um, so I would just like to ask, uh, in this time of social upheaval, what do you think we can learn from the French Revolution? That is the French Revolution. What can we learn from the French Revolution? We can learn how difficult it is. We can learn from those men and women who made the revolution the kind of personal sacrifice that is sometimes required. And we can learn that liberty, democracy, even in times of security, they always have their enemies. There's always the possibility that a society will go complacent and allow those values to be undermined from within. You see, I have had a piece of good fortune, ill fortune, I don't know what you call it. I lived for some years in Saudi Arabia. So I am one of the few people who can say, I have lived under an absolute monarchy. I have lived under a theocracy. So I know what that is like. And makes me realize that the revolution is not a topic in history books. Revolution is not done. Wherever we are, whenever we are, consider what kind of revolution we need. Yes. Well, this, it's tempting to end, but I see some more. Sorry, one last question. One last question. Yes. Okay, well, one of you, one of you, one of you. Uh, yeah, I have a question about historic novels. Yes. Certainly, my portrait of Cromwell runs strongly counter to almost all the biographies there have been until this year, <laughs> when there is a wonderful new biography of Thomas Cromwell. And for the first time, someone else is seeing the man I'm seeing. 
But I think to answer your question in a more general sense, everything depends on the point of view of the author. And from a historian has to do a different kind of job. He has to, um, he or she is operating on the basis of hindsight. Uh, and it is difficult for a historian to avoid judging. Now, I aim not to judge my characters. I try to walk forward with them through history. And at every point, I'm saying to myself, not just what happened, but how did it feel when it happened? Now, to a certain extent, I can only consult myself. I, I cannot write white. I cannot take away my own personality and experiences. But I can make sure that I am not the story. Um, so you erase yourself as much as you can. Amass all the evidence and deal with it honestly. And that is the only way I know. But it's evident from biographies that from a different standpoint, you could come up with a completely different picture of the man. But this is the joy of it, because there are gaps in the evidence, gaps in the record. Are they intentional? Did someone erase that evidence? Or did a rat eat the paper? <laughs> <laughs> and this does happen. <laughs> um, could I ever know if I kept on researching? Or does nobody know? And will nobody ever know? And is there a sort of ambiguity there that we must live with? And in the end, I think that is true. We must live with the ambiguities. If you pick a character and on page one you're thinking, I'm going to write about this character because I understand him. Your book will be dead because your work is already done. So you must pick a character about whom you have a million questions and half a million will never be answered. <laughs> and that is what keeps your portrait alive because there is always flux, contingency, that jitter, which is in human characters and human affairs. Uh, there are always the possibilities that things might be completely otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.